And hello everyone, we are back and we have Deja in the studio. Welcome. Thank you, thank you and good morning everyone. Nice to see you and be here with you, Kyperi. Yeah. yeah, did you have a good night's sleep? <laughs> you dare to say me that I slept well. Yeah, actually I had few few hours to sleep because I thought I have to get some sleep, otherwise I'm not going to be able to speak any English at this hour, but I'm quite all right. How about you? Yeah, I'm fine. Ever been so fresh. <laughs> um, uh, I made a donation of $65 for the profits of cash games and MTV, so now we have $662 gathered up, which is quite nice. Um, we have the one raffle yet to come. Hope there's at least one person who has bought the ticket. We have two licenses to give. And now the stream is without the delay. So now if you as viewers want to communicate with us, now it's easier. We don't have any delays. And <clears throat> the idea for the last two hours or one and a half hours is to talk about how to approach PLO if you haven't played it before. And especially if you have played poker before, so the basics of poker, basic concepts are familiar to you. Um, uh, if I understand right, you played some PLO just a few minutes ago. Yeah, so basically my PLO skills are non-existent. I have practically never played PLO before and I thought that I open one uh, zoom cash table to get uh, quickly some hands for you to analyze okay. and uh, um. please bear with me I have no skills and not <laughs> no knowledge uh, whatsoever you, what to do did you just upload every hand you have that's the problem that in poker shoes you can import only one hand at a time so, okay so probably I have no idea what happens in these hands. So, not sure if I'm going to upload them to Forker Tracker. And then we are going to watch the replay there, and then we are going to open the most interesting ones. Sounds good. I have to save this hand history to somewhere that I can find it. Oh, not there. Okay, and then we import. It's good to see that we have already 66% of donations target amount gathered already. That sounds really good. It is. Now, where are your hand histories? Oh, there it is. And now it isn't. I was clever enough to put it on my desktop and there's only 200 files on it. <laughs> okay, now it's importing You have a strange nickname. Okay. <laughs> um, 99 hands. You, you have been busy. Well, it was Zoom tables. I think that I just wanted to have uh, enough hands since I'm not sure how fast they come up with. Uh, normal cash tables since I'm not a cash. Well, here, here is your craft. Selling a profit of 7 BPs per 100 hands. So you're crossing the micros. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that 90% of the micro regulars and players don't make this much profit. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, 7 BPs per 100 hand is decent. Oh, wow. Maybe I really should start to consider taking this more seriously. Yeah, it's easy game. Um, I'm probably going to filter 
VPIP so we don't have to go through 100 hands, so you played 28 hands. That should be a reasonable amount. And let's see what we have. Are these in time order or in reverse? Jack Queen 7. There's no timestamp. Well, it doesn't matter. We don't care. Well, what happened now? Um, Arnimet is saying, saying something in Skype about donations, but frankly, there's too many sentences I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> if you can just give me a number, I will donate it. I trust you. <laughs> so, streaming 22 hours so far straight takes you know, its toll. Yeah, you have to keep your instructions as simple as possible. Just tell me what to do. That's <laughs> a bit more easier. So, what happens here is that you open open and close and you flop middle pair but you don't see that um, why uh, actually that's one of the things I put to my notes uh, usually I see that but since it seems to me that people are just calling with everything in these mm -hmm. games with uh, <laughs> you know when you have four cards you can hit anything right so I'm not sure how often I should basically see it, like in general. Well, here here is the problem that when you check if you're opening bets, what do you do? I probably call. Okay, and now the opponent knows you don't have a set. You okay. probably don't have a made hand like overbear with high flush draw. So the problem is that when you check instead of c-betting and you check call, you cap your range. And in heads up, well, now good open and can bet the flop. If you're calling, it's quite obvious that you have some kind of draw, most likely a flush draw, because if you had a wrap, you would see bet So if the turn is not lost, he's going to suspend big. And the problem is that when you check call the flop, you create a lot of nasty turn and river spots. So that's why I would often see that. And the rule of thumb is how I approach it in a heads up. But if you don't have a good reason of not to see that, it's always better to see that. Okay. So it, it's not like you are trying to pot control, but trying to more like message to VLAN that you have a good enough of a hand. Well, that then you can represent anything on the turn because you have 100% of your hands in your range. But when you check call, you cap your range. You don't have air, you don't have nuts. So any decent regular can explore you or just force you to fold. And now if I can find the hand in here. Mm, how do I? Okay, does this work? If I copy it here, we paste hand history. We copy it from Poker Tracker, and it should work like if the software works. It might be that my computer is going to explode now. Okay. Um, where's our replayer? There is the opponent is 20 and 12 small sample size, but if we now keep range for him in poker choose, it's easy. We think that he will call here, let's say 30% of the hands, and he is going to trip it in position. He is tripping his nine small sample. Let's say he is going to trip at eight percent. So he is somewhat standard regular. Oh, sorry. That should be three bets, eight percent exclude. 
So now his range is 30% minus the three bad hands. Mm -hmm. But now my broker choose doesn't seem to work. When I'm streaming, it often the engine stops running. Ah, uh, well, your computer has been under a lot of pressure lately. So now let's see if this works. If it doesn't calculate the flop situation, then it kind of do uh, the more complicated calculations. Okay, now it works. Um, let's say um, what kind of uh, in PLO, if we use a simple method for defining range, there's three types of hands: there are flush draws, play draws, and made hands. So we can assume that he is going to call with any flush draw. Um, he is going to call with probably any open ender and better 5 6 plus meaning any hand with 5 6 10 6 4 9 6 jack 10 5 4 jack 9 5 10 9 so any kind of straight draw with at least eight outs and then with made hands what would be the worst made hand he's going to call you i would say um, probably sets. Uh, what sets Oh, he's going to call you with two pairs. Let's give him a wide range of any hand with eight or over pair or two pairs of sets. So any hand that has an at least eight, or nine or higher. So this is really wide point range. This is pretty much anything that hits the board. And now we want to know how often he has one of these hands. And that it's going to be actually 73, 74%. So when you see that you have 40 net with of 27%, 26. So if you make an 8 cent C bet here, then you need to be right around 35 or something, 30% of the time, 40% of the time. So if you had air here, I wouldn't see that. Because the opponent hits the board just so often. He's going to fall around 27% of the time. And with four pursuits, that took five minutes to pick her out. But now you actually have a middle pair and a flush draw and some back doors. That's why I would bet. Because then if the opponent calls and turn is eight or three, you can barrel and you have a lot of falling in with it. But if you check the flop, opponent bets, you call and the turn is eight, then it's turned around. Now the opponent can barrel and make you fold. Okay. Often in heads up, but unless you have a reason that you know why checking is better than betting, always better to bet. Nothing bad can happen even if you see about 100% in heads up. But So is it common to see that like two thirds of the pot or something because it's uh, it's probably a bit <coughs> a bigger amount that I usually use? Yeah, uh, two thirds or three quarters, somewhere around there, is the standard C bet sizing. Then when the board is really dry or it's a locked board, meaning that there's monotone board, paired board ace king queen type of boards where someone either has a strong hand or doesn't have almost anything then half of what is good standard sizing there so i would use if you don't have a reason to adjust your bed sizing two thirds or three quarters of the pot is is good copy that as a standard and of course as soon as you have information to change it you can but what happens here, you check and you make the flush. Now you bet and he falls. Yeah, happens. Well played. 
Mm. I think in general it's quite hard to gather that if I'm in a good way, uh, in a good situation with my hand since there are so many options to uh, flop and your hand will change like all the time. So yeah. I think that's the most difficult thing at the moment. Yeah, but um, remind me that later when we discuss about different stuff, there are some practices that you can do while playing that helps you in that. Yeah, and feel the board changes a lot. Okay, in the next hand you have King H6-5 and blind versus blind once again. You open, oh he folds. That was quick. Queen 7 where did you find all these crappy hands? <laughs> uh, open and bet's half a bot. Um, what do you do? Oh, you fold. I'm going to show you something. How was it this hand? Yeah, uh, queen, four, five, seven. Or what happens here? Oh, it makes no. Oh, here, okay, I'm going to copy it, and then we're going to put poker shoes. Um, here is an instant situation where you can make profit. I'm uh, eager to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's going to see by his whole range here for half a pot. So now we have to define preflop and we don't know much, opponent is 55, 27, 40, so he's pretty aggressive. Let's say he opens like 30% of the hands. So out of this 30% range, if you raise here, and I often use the word 50-50 raise, if you raise to 12 cents, you're risking 12 cents to win 12 cents on the bot. So you have to be right half of the time. So if your opponent folds more than 50% of his range, you create instant profit. And now let's assume that he is going to call here with any flush draw that is 10 high or better. Let's put it in here. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, then he is, of course, going to call with. Let's say pocket kings are better, which is kings, aces, strips, and four houses. Uh, and he might go with seven, eight straight draw. So he's probably made any 10 high flush draw better, straight draws, and any trips, four houses, kings, or aces. And let's see how often he has one of those. Uh, that is 56% of the time. So if you make a raise, it's really close to break even. Of course, you have some equity versus that range. And now if we say that we change his range to ace, ace plus, and he's not going to call you unless he has a wrap. So he's folding open ender, which should be quite understandable. Now he's folding slightly over 50% of the hands. So here it's quite close. So uh, I often raise this. Now if we do small change and we change this 9 to 10 of clubs and then we change 9 high flush aces and now the only straight row is going to be 987 plus. And let's wait for the calculations. Could you please quickly define wrap for me at this point? Oh, wrap is wrap is when you have nine or more out straight row. That's something that you cannot have in Holden. In Holden, the biggest straight row is eight outs. So in PL, when you have nine outs or more with your straight draw, then it's called a wrap. Okay. And wrap can be nine outs or it can be over 20 outs. Or probably 20 out is the biggest straight draw. 
And remember, but you can have 12 out traps, 13 out, 16, 17, 12, 20 straight outs. You can have a huge straight draws in PLO. Oh, wow. And the most common problem when Hoden players come to PLO is that they overvalue pocket pairs and undervalue draws. And do you have any idea, if you don't know the answer, that if you have a flop nuts, what is the worst case scenario that you can be versus a draw? Like what is the worst equity that you can have with the flop nuts if the opponent doesn't have the nuts? Open a, opponent just has a draw. I don't know the answer. Well, if you flop a straight, there are situations where the opponent is 80% favorite with the draw. So you are 2080 underdog with the flop nuts. Seriously? Yeah. That well, sucks. Well, welcome to PL. <laughs> I thought there might be some kind of a catch. Yeah, so you can be in a really bad shape. But here, uh, raising him is quite close. So in a vacuum, raising 12 cents is not profitable. Uh, if you raise to 10 cents, so you're risking 10 between 22, you have to be right 45% of the time. And now he folds 54, which means that it is profitable. Even with the wider range, it was 50%. He needs to fold 45 to be profitable, so it's not profitable. And when you attack these paired boards, then you have more value if you actually hit them. But on average, people fold way too much on paired boards. Like now we assume that he is going with 9 high flush draw. If he has just a bare 9 high flush draw, he's not going to call your check raise. So uh, it's a raise, but not a check raise, right? Well, yeah, it's not a check raise because you are in position. But if he only continues with the not flush draw, then the percentage goes down to 35. So now you have 65% fall in equity. And with 10 cent raise, you need 45. So it's quite profitable. Oh, wow. If he, even if he calls, if you just give up, it's still profitable. So these are the situations that you can do instant profit in PLO. Just raise these bare boards. And uh, what people often do here is they widen their calling ranges. Let's say he widens it into pocket queens or better. So he's going to call with kings or queens. He knows you're bluffing much. He's still going to fold 53, 52% of the time. So it's still slightly profitable for you. And if the board is rainbow, so he cannot have the flush draw. Now, if he widens his calling range even to pocket chaps and the inside wrap, 987. Let's see the number. He's still going to fall over 50%. So the thing is that often. People ask us, when you start to raise these boards a lot, the first thing they do is they are starting to call with kings and queens and pocket pairs. And as we can see often, even if they widen their coin range, it's not enough to prevent you from making instant profit. So on here, when he bets half a board, I would raise always. On this specific situation, it's break even but it's better than just folding. Okay, then we have 6753. Didn't you play any of the good hands? I didn't get any. <laughs> and you said that you're going to play all the pretty hands. But it's red one. Beauty, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> exactly. And now he checks and you bet and he calls. 
Um, what would you think about his range? Do you have any idea? If I would have to guess, uh, consider your previous words, I would say something like flush draw or straight draws. Yeah, if we use the simple method to define range, we have those three categories, flush draws, straight draws, made hands. And if we don't go to any of the combinations or how often he has flush draw versus straight draw, we just say that in his range he has flush draws, he has straight draws. So it doesn't matter what flush draw he has, if the flush comes, he's beating you with the flush. So he has a flush draw in his range, he has any kind of straight draw. Uh, we don't have to think, does he have a cut shot or wrap? It just means that if the turn is eight or higher, he might have a straight. It's in his range. And then on any made hand, when he just goes, we probably know that he doesn't have a set of jack shot wins. But any kind of main hand, pocket kings, aces, queen xxx, any two pairs. So the range is super wide. But it, it's important to start thinking about the range on the flop. Because the more you do it, the more automatic it becomes. And when you practice something enough, it becomes like automatic an instant for you. You don't have to think his range already when he check calls you know that he has any flush or any straight draw. No nuts, no air. Now when the turn comes the first question is does it hit his range? And seven doesn't complete any straight draws, it doesn't complete any flush draws, and it most likely doesn't complete any made hands. So if you want to be aggressive, this is a decent turn to bet bill. But if you bet here, you have to bet 20 or 25 cents. Now when you check, the thing is that once again you cap your range. Now the opponent knows you don't have a queen jack or set. Which means that on this board, if I was the opponent, I would bet. And he dies. Nice. And you fall. And he can easily have a fast draw that if you bet the turn, he would fall. So there's the difference between winning the pot and losing the pot. Um, this hand is not open for me to achieve. And if you wonder what hands can we open, I'm going to show you it with pro proper tools. Old Oracle that you can get for three months with ten dollars. Um, we have the Range Explorer here. That we actually we put your hand here. Seven of clubs, seven of hearts, and we saw the rankings. And on six-handed, you can see here in a bit that it's in top 36 percent so basically if you are opening only value hand from UTG which you should if you want to open 36 percent from UTG then you can include this hand barely and opening 36 percent from UTG is way too much I think 15 percent is more closer to the good opening range so what we want to open from UTG is most likely hands that are in top 15% in rankings. And this hand, even if we change it to double suited, it's barely top 15. And when you open a hand from UTG, you should be always, you should be ready for multi pot. Because if you open and he calls, then it creates this domino effect where everyone else, else calls. So often when you open from UTG, you will have a multi way pot. Now you put one caller and you actually are in position, super rare. And he checks, you flop the cut shot, you check. Now he knows you don't have a strong hand. 
uh, on this turn if I was the opponent I would bet always but he doesn't um, now this bet sizing is kind of funny because if you had a 5-7 or 5 dues, uh, would you use the same bet sizing? Uh, probably a, a bit more. Yeah, because um, if you use the same bet sizing, now comes the question, if the opponent calls and the turn is jack of spades, the pot is 28 cents and the opponent bets 10 cents in the pot of 28 cents, would you call with your straight? Probably. Okay, now if you give him 10 cents as implied odds, when we took the calculator and he's investing 7 cents with the flush draw, and flush draw is 20% equity, it's going to hit one out of five times. So to invest 7 cents, he needs a profit of 35 cents to be break even. And after the call, the pot is 28 cents. So he needs the implied, also, implied odds of 7 cents to be break even. And now if he bets 10 cents and you crawl, he just got more than needed. So it's plus EV for him on the turn. And now to make money in poker, your opponent has to make a mistake. If no one makes a mistake in the hand, then in the long run, no one wins money. And if the opponent calls with the flush draw and you give him the implied odds, then it means that the opponent didn't make a mistake, you did. And therefore, in the long run, you are going to lose money on those spots. So that's why it's important, especially in PLO, where he might have a cut shot than flush draw. So it's even more, more profitable him. Is that if you have a nuts here, bet bigger. So as you are bluffing, I, this half a pot bet, uh, I would never believe that you have a straight. So you can even check ratio for huge folding equity. Okay. So if you are bluffing and you are trying to sell a story, make it believable. But 10 cents even here is more credible. So yeah, I think I think since half bot is so, so you know, kind of a basic stuff for um, uh, sit and goes NL. So yeah, it's but hard hard to that, get my head around it. <laughs> the thing is that the same mathematics apply in Holden. If you put half a bot here, Holden, and the opponent has a flush draw, and he can get ten cents as implied odds, then it's plus EV for him to make the call. But if he calls with the flush draw, then he Jack of spades comes on the river and he checks and you check and he didn't get the implied odds, then the third call is minus EV for him. And this is actually something that a lot of holding players don't think, but it's the difference between making a plus EV call on the turn or minus EV if you need implied odds, if you don't have the odds. To call here, you need 25% equity, and if you have less than that, you need to have implied odds. Otherwise, it's minus EV. But there's crash course to implied odds. Don't worry. Most of the even PLO 50 regulars don't know how to calculate implied odds. And they are making mistakes with those flush draws. But that's one way of reducing the amount of mistakes is to learn how to calculate implied odds. And of course, in sit and the staff sizes are smaller, but it doesn't matter if you have 10 cents behind and you're going to stack off every time when the opponent hits the flush, it's still plus EV for him. I see, okay. A lot of mathematics in PLO. But the thing is that often when there's a we're not going to student, and then I tell them that, okay, we need to work on your mathematics. They say that, oh, I, I, I don't like mathematics. I want to have some rules when I, can I stack off and when I cannot. I try to explain, and in PLO, you have so many different scenarios that 
the whole game is around made hand versus draws. So if you can make mathematically good decisions with your drawing hands or with your made hands, that's when you start to make money in PLO. And when you play by feeling, you are going to make some bad decisions. So let's say, do you have an idea how to estimate your equity? In PLO. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's PLO, RAS, Stud, Hilo, Hold'em. Like if you can calculate that you have 10 outs, how often one of those 10 outs is going to come on the next street? And as you didn't answer in two seconds, I'm going to tell you, uh, there's a formula called 2 plus 2. Easy to remember because it's the forum. Uh, 2 plus 2 means the chance of hitting your outs on the next card is your outs times 2 plus 2. And if you want to be a pro player, if you have over 10 outs, then you can use 2 plus 3. But that's a fast way to estimate how often you will hit one of your outs. <laughs> like if you have seven outs, it's seven times two, it's 14 plus two, 16. One of those outs comes 16% of the time. Yeah. So then 16% of the time is one out of six. So if you want to invest 10 cents, you need to get return of 60 cents if you hit your draw. So calculating implied out is not that hard if you use the simple method. You just have to practice it a lot. But often when opponent shows us that he has a made hand like set or two pairs and we have a draw, we should have a pretty good idea exactly how many outs we have. And then we can calculate how often we are going to hit our draw. And then we can see how much we need as implied out. And then we can estimate and we get that in dots, and if the answer is yes, then we call. And I think one obstacle here is that it's even hard to calculate all the uh, available uh, outs. outs for reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't know which are accountable if my hand is not even good enough after I hit one, some of them, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. And often in the beginning, it's hard to even calculate any of your outs. Um, I thought, thought about earlier that you have these practices. Uh, one way when you are starting PLO is when you are playing, especially when you are not in a hand and the flop comes, try to figure out as fast as possible what are the nuts on that flop. And then when the turn comes, try to figure out as fast as possible does it change the nuts and on the river. Uh, when you practice that sometime it becomes automatic you just know what the nuts are and you instantly know when the turn or river changes the board so that the nuts change and then the next step is to calculate your own outs and it often you have to see how many nut outs you have and then how many outs to improve your hand and it's easy if the opponent's range is top set, then it's easy. You, you know exactly how many outs you have when you filter it out. But if the opponent range is, sometimes he blocks some of your outs, then it becomes harder, and then you have to do estimations. And that's one of the poker skills how good you are in making those estimations. But as with any skill, you need to practice and you need to repeat and repeat and repeat. Repetitions are the key. For those who have read or listened to Mental Game of Porter, there's this learning model for skills that applies to any skill for humans. Is that when you repeat something often enough and practice enough, it becomes automatic. And the idea is that in Porter, you are trying to practice most of your skills in the automatic level. So when you are playing, you don't have to think those stuff. Yeah. You don't really have to think how many outs you have. You know the common situations. 
you can use your timer and brain resources to figure out what to do with that information. But when you start to play piano, 30 second timer, 20 seconds goes to figuring out how many outs I have, then you are using 10 seconds, what do I do with the information, and then you just time out. And it happens. But that's why it's important to practice the things outside the tables. And the more you practice, the more automatic it becomes and more easier it is to play. So if you think about uh, practicing counting outs and figuring out the pot situations, what would be the best way to start to do that? Is there like good uh, software for it or just following the tables and play yourself or...? Um, there are softwares where you can randomize the flop. And with poker tools, uh, you can just randomize the flop here. Randomize. So you can use this to check out how many outs you have versus the nuts. Now we don't have any nuts is 7-7. Seven, seven. I mean aces, do we have outs against aces? No. Do we have outs against aces? Yes. Now is the important question. If the opponent has aces, how many outs we have? If the opponent has ace and flush draw, how many outs we have? So you can use this kind of stuff or you can just write down situations. But, yeah, it takes a lot of practice. I, I would say that if you are a profitable sitting pro player and you want to transition to PLO, I would say that practice all of this stuff at least the same amount as you are playing. Because the sooner you learn the basic skills in the level of automation, the easier and faster the transition in is. Anu Zero says that he notices himself having a good intuition about his equity. Yeah, that's... Some players have a good hunch about equities. And it might be that their unconscious framework does the thing. Or they are just good in estimating but it's, I, I much rather have the exact number than relying on something that I don't know if it's true or not. So counting out is one step. And when you know how to calculate your outs or you can calculate your outs, you begin to see what kind of hands often are good in PLO for hitting combo draws and so on. Um, so in general, I should value draws a lot more than in NL. Uh, yeah, because the thing is that uh, there are so many topics to talk about. Um, like, let's say on this board, you have ace key, which would be pretty nice hand in Hold'em. In PLO, you see that ace key open and close, and now if the turn is anything from, well, let's say the turn is anything else but ace or king. Like, it can be like jack of diamonds. Suddenly you see that the own ace king is not that great. And any four, five, seven, nine, ten completes a straight, any heart completes a flush. Suddenly 60% of the deck completes a draw. Rest can give us, give us open and the two pairs and so on. So often when players overvalue pocket aces and kings, in PLO the problem is that the hand doesn't improve often. Uh, if this board is this and you have tri aces, ace of spades, ace of diamonds, in Hold'em it's still a strong hand, in PLO you bet open and close. Unless the turn is ace, which is two outs, your hand doesn't improve much. If the board pairs, opponent might have trips. If it doesn't pair, he might have two pairs. So often with those top pairs and over pairs, your hand doesn't improve, which leads to a really nasty turn or river spots. You have to check 
turns and reverse if they have your range open and can bluff you, semi bluff you, value bet you, and suddenly you are playing a big pot on the river with try over pair. And it is a lot of problematic spots. So unless you are familiar with those spots and you know what you are doing, then you will get in a lot of problems while with aces. And that leads to another thing. In PL, in PL, it's super important, I would say super, super important that you plan your hand ahead, just like in chess. If I have an ace king on the flop, before I make my flop decisions, I need to think what will happen on the turn. And out of those turn situations, what will happen in the river? And sometimes the decision tree is a bit complicated. So it's important that you do that kind of stuff outside the tables. Like if I see that ace king here and opponent calls, what do I do if the board bears? What does my opponent do with different types of hand? What do I do if the flush completes? What do I do if it's blank? What do I do if, it, do if my hand improves its ace or king? And when you do that, you begin to realize that there are certain hands that you don't want to get in the big pot. Like try aces here, I would see but once, but or probably even not once, depending on my opponent, it's hard to miss this board. So making a pot bigger with a hand that doesn't improve when you don't have a lot of falling equity, it's a recipe for disaster. So you have to plan ahead. Uh, one of the most common problems with my students is that they think that on the flop they have good equity. So they call, but they, they don't have any plan for the turn. They don't think how often the turn helps me, how often the turn is bad for me. Or they see that AC is here, just think that I'm ahead of his range, but they don't think what kind of turn situations I will be. Uh, if you see that AC is here, unless the turn is ace, you sort of have to check and the opponent can bluff you. Are you happy to check on the turn? If you check on the turn, are you happy to check on the river? And so on and so on. So I have to plan ahead. Well, let's see, oh, the opponent folds. Um, now this is probably the best hand so far. It's not great, but it has good visibility. And visibility means that when the flop comes, you know where you stand. Ace, a 7 to the rainbow has really bad visibility. Because unless, unless you hit the set of aces, you don't know where you are, you have try over pair. You bet open and close, you don't know if you are ahead or if you are behind. But with chapter 8, 6, when the flop comes, you pretty much know if you have hit it or not. And you go and you hit top pair, you check, and open and checks. Um, how would you define his range? I think there isn't any made hands. Yeah. So um, now when he checks, you know that probably no nuts, no set. So it caps his range. So now you have the best hand always. So probably bad, but even if you didn't have the A, I would bet this turn. And he check raises, wow. Um, How about my bet size there? Well, I would bet 10 cents since it's for value, but half pot is fine. Opponent is shorty. Uh, now the question is, what do you do? <laughs> I'm, not <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what I should do there since uh, uh, okay, what is, uh, according to our range definition on the flop, what is the best hand that the opponent could have? Mm, full house. Uh, if he doesn't have any made hand on the third, uh, on the flop. Two pairs yeah, well, considering that, um, I 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if we assume on the flop that he doesn't have two pairs of sets, now trip eight is the best hand. And if he has eight in his hand, I would assume that he see bets often. So to me, this looks like some kind of aces or kings with the flush draw, or some kind of combo draw. And even if he has ace eight, you have nine outs if all of your cards are alive. So I, I would definitely stack off here. But you just call and get the effective nuts on the river. And he folds. Wow. Probably had some sort of draw. But yeah, I, I would jump the flop because he shouldn't have a full house ever. Oh, I see what you mean. How about that shoving thing? Uh, since it's pot limit and not no limit, uh, is it possible to shove or just like shove like it looks like it's uh, pot committed already? Or well, he has seventy two cents behind, and you can raise eighty seven cents more. Okay, so then it's not a problem. Yeah, you can get it in easily, and you have the best hand almost always here. And it might be that if he has something like five, six, seven with hearts, you just missed value when you call. Oh, he doesn't have hearts because he can step up here. Uh, Yambai is asking the chat, uh, are we going backwards as we are already talking about board swap without any idea about hand selection? Well, probably right. Uh, I told you about the UTC 15%. Uh, hand selection is not a problem for Hold'em players. Um, I would say that good starting point is what's Oracle Range Explorer. Uh, you can use it free on ProPropertools.com on the website. And try to set some set numbers, 15% uh, from UTG, 20% from the middle position, 25, 35, and so on. The thing is that if you want to open a lot of hands pre-flop, then you need to have good post-flop skills. Like if you open with 80% range on the button, but you have no idea about post-flop, then you are going to lose a lot of money. But if you are good in post-flop, reading boards, reading opponents, then you can open it like 80% or 90% range from the button, even 100% in some scenarios. So your postal skills decide what you can do pre-flop. And my advice is always, in the beginning, tighter is better. When your range is tight or stronger, in other words, then you will have a little bit easier decisions compared that you start to open with 50% range and you have a lot of really nasty spots where you have no idea what you do, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's easier to start tight and then loosen up than it would be if you start with VPIP 50 and then try to figure out where should you tighten up. So play tight. Just remember that play tight from UTG and play tight from the small blind. Um, one of the problems that holder players also have is that they defend their blinds too often and with bad hands. In Hold'em, you can free bet as a bluff from the blinds. In PLO, you can. You don't have folding equity for your free bet. Some of the time, open and fold, but you can never count on folding equity when you three bet. So always when you three bet, you should be prepared to play the pot and when you retrieve it from the blinds, what you are doing is that create a big pot where you are out of position. And in Hold'em, when you squeeze in micro piano, it's not a squeeze, it's let's make a big three-way pot where I'm out of position. Because no one folds the three bets. And oh, here's the next hand. 8854, where are all the good hands? You made 100 hands, and these are the things you found out. <laughs> and probably, I think, yeah, not sure what you folded, but yeah. I'm pretty sure I didn't fold the best hands available. 
uh, here half of what bed sizing. The problem is that you just give great odds for in green jack then type of hands, even a king. Uh, I would bet Santi Pilker because he's going to call with any ace, probably with any king. You miss value by betting so small. And he folds. Okay, now we have a PLO hand. Now, if this is a decent PLO hand, there's a lot of things you can hit. You can hit the set, you can hit the flush draw, you can hit the straight draws, you can hit the wrap. And you can 3 bet and you oh you fold. Uh, with this hand, you can definitely try. If it was rainbow or green or nine is lower than seven or something or eight, then you can fold. But now you are in position with hand that can hit the flop in many, many ways. So definitely call 12 cents in the pot of 36 and see the flop. He's out of position. He has to see, but and then you can make the decision what do you want to do. So in general, um, I wouldn't fold the three bets in position a lot, especially with this strong hand. Now we have a really nice hand. Um, here you can just put it. You want to isolate the limper, so instead of three PBs, just make it to nine. Yeah, clearly, I have lots to learn about the bed sizes. Uh, yeah, free for bed sizing. I would say that against green person, you can just put it from UTG middle position, you can put it from cutoff and button, depending how much you open. The more you open, the smaller the bed sizing should be. Uh, but if you play only like 20% value hands, you can put it from any position. But when you start to play more hands from cutoff and button, then you need to balance out the ranges by making smaller bets. But here you have the trips, half a pot is fine, open and folds. No can do. Oh, now we know the opponent hands. It's easier to put him on a range. And half a pot, once again, even smaller than half a pot. Uh, the thing is that if the board is paired, you can use half a board, but now you give great odds for any draw. And now the opponent knows you don't have a made hand. Of course, now um, I hope you love the river. You do. Uh, Spit sizing kind of small but it doesn't matter he's he's not going to fold his straight here but if he didn't have a straight he would check fold here so overall it's decent you shouldn't have the deuce of hearts doesn't change the board so on draw heavy board like this one when open and close and the turn is totally blank, you don't have a lot of folding equity because he still has the same draw as on the flop. So, yeah, checking is fine, but on the river, when he checks, uh, I would bluff it always. But with bigger bet size? Yeah, probably slightly bigger. And you win a pot. What? Is that a crappy hand? Yeah, that is. <laughs> it's double suited, but if you start to think that what can you hit with this hand is some kind of draws, non nutty draws, and bottom set. So I, I would just fold here. Often when playing from the blinds, the problem isn't your preflop pot odds. Like here, you have to pay for uh, three cents in the pot of 11. You have great odds preflop. But the thing is that you're out of position, so even if you hit your hand, it's hard to get value. And with these hands, you are going to flop marginal hands or some kind of draws, and those are really hard to play out of position. So I would just fold. And now you have me up there and cut shot. Opening checks makes your life easier, and now I think you should bet. 
when you check, you know your opponent doesn't have a straight. So you can create a lot of phone inequity here. Now by saying that hero is on the button, um, I don't know what hand you referred. Probably nothing super important. Uh, now you have a great hand. Now this hand with the rundown 1098, you can hit with straight draws and you have the nut flush. You can hit uh, if the board is 6 7 of spades, you have a huge hand. And no one plays with you. And here, once again, we have a really crappy hand, ace, queen, five, five. Um, as a rule of thumb, don't set mine with small pocket squares. Because what you're going to hit with a pair of fives is the bottom set. And the more you play small pocket squares, the more often you won't be set versus set with the smaller set. There's a lot of set versus set, flush versus flush, straight versus straight situations in PLO. Uh, if you draw to these bottom sets, you will find that you are going to lose a lot of money. Not flush, yes, you call. You make the nuts. Uh, actually, the villain makes the nuts. Oh, you're this one. Oh, sorry. I thought this one is you. Um, then we go back to pre-flop. Pop a tens in PLO is crappy hand. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> now that I see and it, I don't know why I'm open. Ten high flush draw sucks. If you hit it, you don't know if you should bet it or should you bluff catch. Open and can have higher flush. This hand is going to just give you problems. Just fold it. Yeah. And on the flop, now you have a cut shot and over pair. You make that half a pot better. Oh, you really love half a pot. I do. I so do love it. <laughs> and now you make the straight open and bet. And um, the thing here is that if he has a flush, you have zero outs. You have zero percent equity. And he throws the flop and puts the turn. Oh, he's representing the flush all the way. So fold pre-flop, fold turn, flop and reverb is nice. So why is the villain only checking behind me? Uh, on the river, because the, yeah. board, because the board bears. Okay. So you really should be more afraid of that. Yeah, some people learn it straight away. Some people has to lose a lot of money until they realize that when the board bears, it's like if he bets the river, he tries to get value from king high, queen high flushes, or whatever the second or third not flushes are. But when the board pairs, it's a huge chance. Like the flush completes on the turn, he makes a pot bet you call, so it looks like you might have two pairs of set. So often people don't like to bet with flushes when the board pairs. In PLO, when you play enough, you see that you should be afraid of nuts often. When people start to put money in the pot, they pretty often actually have the nuts. Here you call out of position, set mine with clean high flash draw. Uh, I think, yeah, there's one code caller, big one will call way pot set money but the thing is that even if you hit the set of jacks let's say the flop is jack seven five rainbow what do you do i'm in trouble are, <laughs> yeah you are first to act and you have the nuts what would you do if the flop is jack seven five rainbow uh, well in that case i'm working or well, acting as a first player so i hmm? think i probably i don't want to try to scare anybody away but yeah, so often you check, then everyone checks, and river is nine completely straight. Uh, turn is nine. 
and then I hate my life. Yeah, then you have to check. Okay, everyone checks and turn is 10, completely in even more straits. You have to check and you didn't get any value. So that's the problem out of position that even if you hit your hand, it's hard to get value. Or let's say you have not flush draw and you flop the not flush draw. You check open and pass your call and turn completes the flush. What do you do? You have to check often. Open and checks behind. Now river you might get value or river pairs you have to check. So being out of position is more than just the opponents can have more information for the decisions. Being out of position means that even if you hit your hand, you don't get as much value as in position. Often what said is that out of position, you miss one street of value. So even if you flop the nuts, you often get only two streets of value at maximum, unless it's a setup. And now you totally missed the flop. No one bets. Now someone should bet, no one bets. And now you bet, um, is this a value bet or a bluff? I think since no one has been active, it's value. Okay, what worse hand is going to call you? Some random two pairs. That queen jack? I would think so. Um, queen jack might call you, but there are two straights, possibly these 9, 10 and 5, 7. There's a flush. Someone might have said, so even if Green Chapel, it's not an easy crawl on the river. So I would probably check crawl myself, give open an opportunity to bet. Against better hands, you lose that same one bet, no matter if you bet or you check crawl. But when check crawling, you might get value from there, plus. Yeah, maybe I thought that people are they're more eager to call, but probably that's before the river. Um, yeah, people like to call, but on the river, like if you have a queen chat, I don't know even what nuts it is. There are two possible straights. There are flush possibility. Someone might have a set. Even queen chat is pretty bad bluff catcher there. Or it's a bluff catcher, but quite hard to call. And the thing is that open and might play with any smaller flush, they might play with straights. And if you want to value bet, then you have to beat at least half of your open and calling range. And if open and calling range is any flush, any straight, queen, chat, then I would assume that 75% of his calling range beats you when you, you just can't bet for value. But did yeah. I have a? I probably read. Ah, uh, no, never mind. Yeah, forget it. Yeah, I think you made it fine. Not yeah. much you can do. Pre-flop, have to go on the flop, chip, chip. Uh, on the turn, you pick up the top pair and open in there. When the flop goes chip, chip, he knows you don't have a chap. So I think he's going to bet here often and fold. And uh, we you make a straight, can bet chip, chip, and win the pot. So, I would play it in exactly the same way. Um, steal from the button and hit bottom to half a pot bet. Uh, you want him to fold. The thing is that unless you hit twos or five, your hand doesn't improve a lot. There's a lot of good turns for you that give you some more equity, but none of those improve you enough that you can start making big value bets on the turn. So with bottom two, if you win the pot on the flop, you are happy. Because if he calls, he has any chap excess in his range. So any turn besides two or five can give him higher two pairs. So I, I would be better here. But he fold. <laughs> Can you give me that number for um, steel range from button again? Uh, no. Sorry. It depends. Okay. Okay. Um, 
if you are if you use 2.5 BP bet then probably if the opponents combine me defend enough then you can make all the profit but if the opponents fold enough then you can open 100% of your range same as in home if the opponents fold often enough you can open any four cards and create instant profit so it always depends on opponent if we have VIP 100 player here then there's no point in opening up trashy hands because we don't have any folding equity pre-flop then we need to open hands that we can often value bet on the flop so should but, I open two uh, 2.5 or yeah I, I use 2.5 because mean raise no one is going to fold the big blind and with real crappy hands you don't necessarily want to see the flop but you know, it always depends on your opponent what kind of opponents they are how aggressive they are post flop like if there are people who are check raising a ton and don't bet in a lot then you don't want to open crappy hands because crappy hands don't hit flops often on a quick side note, thank you, Cooper, for your donation. Much appreciated. Ooh, donation. And pocket checks open. No action. Limper, limp. Top pair. Value bet under half a pot. Bet picker. Oh, now you should fold. Oh, you don't. Uh, the question is, what kind of range do you give your opponent on the flop when he calls your bet? Cross. Yeah. Some kind of straight draw. Uh, what else? Uh... I don't know, probably there could be some made hands, but... Uh, definitely, there's, there's always made hands. Like, with ace-queen, he wouldn't raise. Pair of kings, pair of aces, who knows. So but if he would have, like, over a pair, would he raise there? No. And as we saw today, people, even with pocket queens, they might just call. But often they don't want to raise, like, King Queen type of King Queen Jack type of hands or seven nine King Jack. So when he calls he either has a straight draw or some kind of made hand. And now turn is six of clubs and he dodges for a pot. Would he do this with his whole range? Would no. he do this with King Queen? No, he wouldn't. I okay. think that's a really stupid call from my part. Yeah, because now he either has a straight or the six improves his made hand range a lot. So I would say that most often he has the straight and you are drawing dead. And now you actually make the smaller straight. So you give him a lot of value. Uh, this looks nice, but it's quite crappy. Good for stealing. It, it's better for opening, but it's really bad for calling. But you open, everyone falls. Instant profit. Pocket kings. Uh, this is probably one of the best things that can happen. You have built six way all in, and uh, not all in six way. Multiway pot, because pocket kings are powerful hand in multiway pots because if you hit the set it's most often the top set and you can really set versus set people but on the flop you totally miss it i hope you fold yes aces and you actually flop half a pot bed <laughs> you know me yeah the problem is that Let's say he has 7-8 with the spade draw, he gets huge odds for calling. Almost with the fast draw he gets the odds because 
if he, if he makes the flash you're going to give him value bit bitter especially on these straw heavy boards but he found um ace king suited in plo is worse than ace queen suited which is worse than ace jack suited because if you have ace and king of the same suit the thing is that you block the king high flush and with ace high flush the hand that gives you most value is going to be the king high flush and now the opponent cannot have it the best oh. flush opponent can have is queen high and you pay much less value from green high flushes than king high flushes I often see. the difference is that with king high flushes people step off and with queen high they just crawl so you don't want to have ace king of same position. ace king eight eight this is not a good hand from this position maybe from cut off from button but from middle position i i wouldn't even open it just fold it straight away yeah pocket eights middle sets bottom sets you will have middle set versus top set quite often. Kings definitely open. You miss the board. Opening don't have a board, but you have nothing. Uh, I would say it's just fold. Save your money. And now you hit the two hour, but flash completes. And wow. And you have his money. Nice, but you should fold the flop. You have two outs that improve your hand. Everything else you have to fold your open arrows. Okay. So this is exactly on the flop where you need to think ahead. Let's assume that the opponent bets most of the turns. What are the turn cards that you are happy to call his barrel? Besides two kings. Um, if the turn is ace of diamonds and opponent bets 20 cents, would you call? No. So then there's probably. If you are only going to continue on the turn, if you hit the king, that is going to happen one out of 20 times. So if you fold 19 out of 20 times on the turn, then you shouldn't call the flop. And they still have a really good plan of what to do. Okay, so don't uh, overestimate your over pairs. Yeah, or if you have a plan. Like, okay, opening is going to barrel on paired boards, I'm going to make a move, or I'm going to do a short combo float, I'm going to crawl, and if turn completes, draw and my opponent checks, I can bet, turn it to a bluff, and so on. If you have a plan, then you can crawl. But if you just call and, oh, I have over pair. I'm ahead of his range, I crawl. up. But you don't think what kind of turn situations you are going to get into. What is going to happen that you're going to fall like 19 out of 20 turns. And that's bad. But if you have a plan on the flop and you know what you are going to do when, if the heart comes and he checks, if straight completes and he checks, if the board bears and he checks, if the turn is black and he checks, if you have a plan for those or you want to raise some turns as a bluff, then it's fine. But as I said earlier, especially with these kind of hands that your hand is not going to improve 19 out of 20 times. So you need to have a plan for it. The worst option is to crawl and then when the turn is Send of diamonds and open and checks, and then you wonder, oh, what do I do? I have no idea. Then you didn't make the plan on the flop. So but how about that turn bet? Is it okay or is it the stupid me the uh, stupid decision to do since the flush comes? Uh, when open and checks, I would assume that he doesn't have a flush. You have ace of hearts blocker. He might have the flush. <laughs> But like 14 cents, if he calls 14 cents, it doesn't matter. You have almost 25% versus flushes. So even if he calls with the flush, it's still more than plus EV for you. And he might have a set of jacks, eights, whatever. 
Okay. So when he checks, uh, I would definitely bet the turn. And another crappy hand. Um, now, if you're wondering how good of a hand is, one good way to filter out the string is filtering out and thinking what you are going to flop. And with this hand, what do you want to see on the flop? Small cards. Okay, you want to see the straight. What if you don't hit the straight? Then I'm out of there. I mean, the next question is how often you're going to flop straight. Uh, straight. No idea. Okay, next question. Uh, from the range of 1 to 100 hand rankings, if I put this hand into odds oracle hand rankings, what would you estimate its ranking is going to be? Well, I'm sure it's not a good hand, so... Okay, how bad it is? Um... Just give me a number. Is it in top 50? Top 75. <laughs> oh, why nice? Top 76. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's super crappy. Don't invest five cents. The problem isn't if you hit the nuts or if you totally miss the board. Those are easy ones to play. But what if the board is something like a75? You have top and bottom two pairs. Or king for deuce, bottom two and punch up. This hand is going to flop so many problems that you are going to lose a lot of money. So just fold it pre-flop. Don't get yourself into really bad flop situations. I get it. Good. And now you have to fold, yeah. So every, every time when you pay five cents, if you think that, oh, it's five cents in the pot of 21, I put huge odds. The thing is that when you pay five cents, then on the flop you put a bet and you have to fold when someone gives you action. You're going to lose a lot of money over the long period of time. The race, everyone folds. Um, four, five, five, twos from UDG. Uh, as I said, that when you open from UDG, you Oh, it's the V-line. Oh, it is, sorry. I thought it was you. I should be focusing more. Um, you crawl. Heads up situation, heads up but out of position is the worst situation that you can be in ha in PLO. And now you are putting yourself into there with a sort of crappy hand. The opening open from you, Dichi, so he should have a strong hand. And your hand is ranked at 66%. So it's, it's super crappy hand. And now the question is, what do you want to see on the flop? Spades. Uh, how many? Three or two? Uh, probably if there's three, I'm not going to get any value if I hit my flush yeah. later on. Okay, what if the flush draw comes? How do you play it? Let's say the board is... King nine five with two spades. Do you check? I think I should bet. So you don't bet. And when you don't bet, the problem with don't betting is that you don't get any value from your opponent's heir. So he is probably going to raise you if he has two pairs of better, or he's going to call you with some kind of straw. So now the problem is that being out of position, even if you hit the flush draw, it's hard to get value. And besides flush draw, this hand is not going to flop almost anything strong. And you have three spades, so you're eating one of your own, your own outs. So this is super clear fold. You don't have to defend your big blind by entering the pot with crappy hand. 
<laughs> I don't know why the opponent doesn't bet the flop or even the turn or even the river. He has to bet to win the pot. Oh, that was the last hand. Um, <clears throat> uh, as you can see, there probably isn't an easy way to earn PLO. Like in, in Hold'em, if you are totally new to poker, you can learn Hold'em step by step. You can start with free for hand selection chart, open these hands. If someone opens, go with these hands and raise with these hands. And it won't have you started. In PLO, you cannot have a pre for hand charts because often it depends on the opponents, it depends on stack sizes, it depends on how many players there are and so on and so on. But you can have some rough guidelines like what kind of hands we open from each position. But you cannot make any compact brief of hand chart. I, I've seen people making hand charts and that's like two papers of small print of every possible combinations of hands. And I'm not sure if anyone has time to read those. So you just have to learn what is a good hand and what is not. One way to learn about PLO hands is to read Seth Wang's book, Body Mitoma had the big play strategy. It, it's his first book written for full ring, not betting. The idea of that strategy in full ring is to wait until you have the nuts and retraw. But in that book, there's a good section about Omaha starting hands. And of course, it's made for full ring, so you shouldn't be reading it as a Bible. But there's good explanation what makes a good PLO hand. And there's really good explanation why drawing hands are so powerful. And one of the power of wraps is that when you have enough nut outs, 13 or more, or 14 or 15 or more, no one can raise you out of the pot. If you have over 33% equity versus opening range, it doesn't matter even if he pots, if you have straight equity to crawl. So with the big draws, no one can bet you to fold. So that's one starting point for pre for hand selection. But then comes the hard part. There are so many things that affect our decision making that there isn't any fast way. Often the way I see that you just have to dig in and start to practice one concept at a time. And probably in the beginning it might feel super confusing. Like there are 20 things you have to think about. And every time when you make a question, instead of answer, you get more questions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, uh, you ask that, can I shove two pairs here? And the answer is starting, it depends. And then you can have five more questions. It depends what is his range, uh, what are you representing, how much are the effective stacks, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's frustrating. I know I'm... When I was starting PO, I made a post to Poker Forum about how do you play trips in PLO? Because I'm having a hard time playing trips when I flop the trips. And instead of someone tell me just straight guidelines how to play trips, I got an answer, it depends, and then 10 more questions how to approach the situation. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I want to know the answer. But now I realize that there isn't answer. It depends that is it over trips like 773, do you have a 7? Or if it's 73 and you have the 3, is it over or under trips? Do you have over or under cards? Is there plus draws, straight draws, and so on and so on. So you cannot say that always stack off with trips or always low play trips. It always depends on the situation. But when you keep practicing and just trying to answer the questions that arise, at some point it will start to make sense. And 
when you get into the point that you know the preflop, you know basic concepts, you know how to calculate your equity, both odds, implied odds, out, so on. When you start to practice about putting your opponent in the range, that's where poker choose is one of the best tools. Because here, when you open a hand, and let's say, let's use this hand. On pre-flop, opponent opens, we call on the flop, he makes a bet. <coughs> when you put his reins into here, you have to write something on the pre-flop and probably on the flop turn. And when you are writing the range, it helps you to put him on rings. You kind of just think that oh, he can have anything, but you have to write here what is that everything. And the way Borkensius works that you kind of add something to his range that isn't in his flop range. So you're, you are always narrowing down the range. And in PLO often, when you start to think what the opponent could have, the list is going to be really long. So it's always easier to think what he shouldn't have. Can we narrow down something from his range based on his actions? Like if opponent check close here, we can be pretty sure that he doesn't have a set of kings or eights or some big combo draws. And he doesn't have air. So we narrow down his range from both ends. And when you just write those ranges into here over and over again, you will become better and better in putting people in ranges. Often holding players think that in PLO it's impossible to put people in ranges, but it's not impossible. The ranges are just wide. But you can narrow down towards the river and then on the river, often what happens is the opponents represent something that shouldn't be in their range and you bluff catch. As we saw many times today when I was playing that uh, doesn't make sense, he's representing something he shouldn't have, and we call and you open half bluff. So it was a bad bluff. Okay, so you can uh, calculate your equity on the each different street, uh, and you can, like with every street, narrow it down all the way till the river where you make the final decision, probably. Well, and you can make the final decisions of what will turn, depending on step sizes. Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. But it helps. When you narrow down the range, it's easier to make decisions than just simply that he can have anything. That's, that's not concrete enough. And learning PLO is it's a long process. But when I have talked with the students, private students, Pretty much every one of them say that after they have learned PLO, where you just have to learn, you don't have these rule of thumbs as you might have in some other games at basic level. Then they say that they have become better poker players. Like there are a lot of students that uh, they have tried PLO and then went back to sit in coach or hold them a tournament, but they say that now they approach the poker in different way. Like in Hold'em, they never thought about implied odds, now they know and they are able to make some good folds or good calls and so on and so on. PLO is a fun game. Yeah, I'm starting to think that it's way more complicated than I thought and I thought that it's super complicated. <laughs> yeah, it seems complicated, but when you start to practice PLO and if you put up the work, then at some point it's like a big bang and suddenly it all opens up for you and you, you begin to see that almost everything affects everything and everything depends on everything. But at some point it starts to make sense and you will see the whole picture. And I, I would say that when you do that, then you see the poker in a whole new way. And it's a good thing, it opens a lot of doors to play the poker in a slightly different way. And it gives you more room to make bluffs 
because you understand the situations better and you become better at planning ahead on the flop you already know what kind of turn and river situations you will probably be and what to do in those but yeah probably this two hour crash course in PL doesn't help you much but it's almost impossible to teach PL in two hours uh, there are some books that you can read PL from scratch is a free ebook um, Jeff Wang's books are nice the only problem is that he doesn't think he ranges he's such an old school but there are some nice thoughts but PL from scratch is a good starting point and oh. then there is the poker pro tools you can use for ranges right uh, pro poker tools you can use like this range explorer if you want to know is it a good hand or not like a screen seven deals is top 66 percent of the hand super crappy hand so it gives you idea what hands are strong and what not it's not the absolute truth you always have to think that is the pot multiway or heads up in multiway pots you need to have a lot of not potential in a heads up you need to have often a good port coverage like seven six five four double shooted rundown it's going to hit a lot of flops in some way so it's quite good in wow ben when it donated 328 what what really unbelievable awesome oh dear that is a lot of stuff that's awesome thank you so much ben Manlit. highly no. appreciated uh, did you pick a big tournament or something we are up in 1000 i think oh yeah uh, now this interrupted me and my thoughts um i was about to say that yeah we'll feel better and the kids are feeling better uh, in a heads up what like 7654 double suited is great in heads up but it sucks multi way because multi way you want to have a nut potential and 7654 double suited is going to flop bottom two pairs no nut straight small flush draws and that kind of stuff so in multi way pot you want to have a nut potential nut flush draws high pairs high cards and then in heads up what you want to have with port coverage so that changes like some of the hands might not be in top 15 but they are pretty playable in heads up pots so we have one more thing to do if i just find oh we have 1000 uh, i was about So I have to donate twenty-two and a half dollars for Chambalaya, as he said that what it, whatever is left after the crowdfunding can be put on the pot. So I'm going to make that donation now. This is incredible. So we hit our target amount. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy, and I'm <laughs> I love you guys like, seriously. You have made this happening. Oh, it might be 22. Okay. Um, how do I go back? So to, we cannot donate 22 and a half, so I'm going to donate 23 for Yambalaya. So we are actually over our target amount after so, this donation. So 24 hours of poker streaming, PLO cash, PLO tournaments, MTT sitting those, teaching Omaha and teaching everything and for everyone, everybody around the world and we got over thousand bucks for charity. Thousand dollars and 23 is the final amount and now we Let's see if we can do a raffle in the end. If there's any tickets for the last poker choose software, um, just have to close. 
Launch the reward. Just a second, it's in here, and now it's off. And let's see if we can make a raffle. It has been a long day, and it has been a long, long day for Cooper. I really three, have to thank you for minutes. your all effort. Three minutes. Oh. <laughs> oh, here's the. Uh, It's nice to make history with you guys. That's all I can say at this point. I'm almost wordless. Oh, there is one. <laughs> Do you know who's the one? There's only one ticket for the raffle. And it, it's you. Oh, it's me! <laughs> we don't have to raffle. You got yourself a license. Woo! Yes! One it's license, like... <laughs> one license for stress can. Thank you, know, you so can... much. So now you get three months with poker tools. You can play PL and then analyze the hands. This seems to be like a destiny calling my name. Yeah, forget those sitting goes. Yeah, uh, well how the, about PLO sitting goes? The problem is that they are not running. Ah. And even if they are, the problem is that if you play some turbos or 50-50s where the stack size gets shallow pretty quickly, the problem is that where does your edge come from? Like we, as we talked in PLMTT session that when you have 10 BBs, it's really hard to get edge over anyone. Because you kind of bluff a lot and then when the money goes in, it's almost, almost always 50-50 flips and so on. So it's hard to get a huge edge that you can beat the rate and PLO system calls don't run you might get one or two every now and then but you cannot make like 40 system calls at the same time and that's why there are no PLO system calls experts so but I shouldn't start to be learning to be the first no, one I can't do cash games I mean, <laughs> Um, Maybe I start to consider that for sure. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't you want to do this kind of stuff? It's roller coaster. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Whee! <laughs> well, to be quite honest, I know how that feels like. I have yeah. had quite a swing since it then goes as well. So yeah. it's not like I'm not used to those. Yeah, so you, you are already familiar with the swings. So your mental game is better than with most PLO players. <laughs> That's a good pep talk. Yeah. Um, clock is 10 a.m. in the morning, and I think we are pretty much done here. Somehow we have the EXO. Okay. Um, I'm probably going to get asleep now. Thank you, everyone. And we actually made a lot of money for the children over $1,000, that's huge. And we have had nice games. We had, at least I had fun playing tournaments, although I hate tournaments even more now. But there were some fun moments. There were some super fun moments with the cash games, like straight flush over quads and so on and so on. And one out of quads versus full houses. And a lot of funny stuff going on. And we might do this again, but not in the near future. <laughs> so what are your final thoughts after playing that many hours straight? Mm, it went better than I expected. And not in a profit way, of course, it went better. 30 BBs per 100 is huge. But playing or staying up 24 hours and still be able to maintain some quality in the end is quite amazing. I, I expect it to be more exhausted at this point. But at what time was the hardest spot? I don't know, somewhere around midnight or one, or was it 11 in the evening, I started to have a headache for a moment then. It was probably the longest hours where during the 
middle part of the antithesis. Then in the end, if, if I'm better, and after a few hours of pure antithesis, I was starting to wait for the cash games. And more action, because in tournaments it was just waiting for the hand. There wasn't any creativity. How do you pronounce it? Creativity. Yeah. Yeah, because you just have to wait for a hand, and then with 10 BB steps, you can it in if you have an action. So it wasn't that interesting. Of course, it's interesting to see how much money we can make, but Wayne was not that creative. While in cash games, there's a lot more options. I hate tournaments. <laughs> okay. It, but it's fun like... at the final table, but they always end up in a nasty way. So did you get in third in one of the tournaments? Yeah, third. Fifth and third. Awesome. Congrats. And last time we had PLMTVs, we were on those same iPoker tournaments. We were third in both of them, five dollar, uh, five euro and ten euro rebuy, so iBorker has been good for me in tournaments. But I would say good night or good morning. And we can continue on the forum having talks, what has happened and so on and so on. Thanks everyone and thanks for everyone who watched it and thanks for the few brave who were up with me for the whole 24 hours, that is huge. And we probably made history. This might have been the first 24 hour poker stream for charity ever made, at least what I know. So thanks for making history. Yes, for sure it's first in Finland, but I didn't find any reference on the internet that anyone has done this before. So thank you and have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you all.